Ryan, let me let me let you and your listeners in on a secret. Everyone who's at the top of their game, who's a creative professional, is doing this. You know how they say that we can only access 20% of our brain? This lets you access all of it. In Coding Greatness, I talk about all these techniques that you can use that range from something I call reverse outlining, which is, you know, everyone's heard of outlining. When you're a college student, you would outline your paper by putting in bullet points what you're gonna put in every paragraph, and then you would write those paragraphs. Reverse outlining is traditional outlining's sneak your cousin, which is take a finished product and then work backwards to see mm. if you wanted to reduce every paragraph into one bullet point, what would it look like? And when, by the time you're done, you've got an outline of what needs to happen in every paragraph and that's a template that you can then uh, apply to your and i think it's all about having a mindset of a curiosity but also b thinking in blueprints mm -hmm. every time you experience something extraordinary don't just enjoy it passively think about how does this work how do i recreate it and how do i apply it to something that i'm working on in order to improve and so I think just having that mindset of curiosity, of breaking things down, figuring out what the elements are, is a crucial step that doesn't get discussed. Uh, my general process is, uh, you can think of it as DISS, so D-S-S-S, -S -S, okay? And the first step is deconstruction, and that entails taking learn X, which is generally very large and nebulous, learn Spanish, and breaking it down into component parts and making it a measurable goal. So first is kind of deciding on exactly what you're trying to accomplish, and then asking a set of questions, either to Google and or to experts. The next is selection, and that's doing an 80-20 analysis. What are the 20% that are going to get me 80% to my goal, right? What are the, what are the critical few? And very often with, say, language, it's the highest frequency words. You don't have to the learn. Top 1,000 words or Yeah, top 1,000 words are going to get you through 75%, 80% of any conversation. Then you have uh, sequencing, putting things in the right order. This is, I think, the most neglected secret sauce. It's like, how do you take what you've decided, what you've gathered, and put it into a logical progression? This is where things often fail. Like, like really this first, then this, yeah, then like, this. Like for each skill, asking yourself, like, what are the prerequisites to this skill? For people who can't do it, what are the prereqs? And if someone says, well, like today we're gonna practice this, well, what should I be able to do before this? Technically and physically, maybe even emotionally. And the last one, which is almost universally neglected. The is, third S. The third S is stakes. You need to build in incentives, because for most of us who are trying to learn something, not always, sure. These are extracurriculars, right? So if, if you're trying to learn something for your job, the incentive is don't get fired or get a raise, right? You have built in incentives. But for I'm going to learn fill in the blank, right? I'm going to learn how to play tennis in my spare time or try to learn a little bit of French before I go to France like six months from now. You need incentives. You're only going to be as faithful to your goals as your incentives compel you to be. That's it. And so if I wanted to achieve the type of outcome that I desired, doing well in school, I was going to actually have to change my approach. And so I made a marginal adjustment. If I would get an assignment, let's say read five chapters in a book, I wouldn't think of it as five chapters. I wouldn't even think of it as one chapter. I would break it down into these tasks that I could achieve that would require me to focus for just five or 10 minutes at a time. This whole idea, it worked really well in school, it's been serving me well as a professional. Why aren't I applying this in my personal life? Like to all those big ambitious goals I have for myself. So what other big ambitious goals have been holding on to, putting off until retirement, that I could potentially achieve if I just made a marginal adjustment to my routine? So I started doing them. I earned my auto racing license. I learned how to fly a helicopter, did rock climbing, skydiving and learned how to fly planes aerobatically. All I do is take really big, ambitious projects that people seem to marvel at, break them down to their simplest form, and then just make marginal improvements along the way to improve my odds of achieving them. And so the whole reason I'm giving this talk is I'm hoping to inspire several of you 
to pull some of those ambitious dreams that you have for yourself off the bookshelf and start pursuing them by making that marginal adjustment to your routine. We don't learn by trying to put stuff into our brains. We actually learn counterintuitively by trying to take stuff out of our brains. And so if you've had that experience where you've read something in a textbook or on a website and someone asks you about it a few days later and you've completely forgotten about it, that's just because you haven't tested yourself on that knowledge. But if we move towards thinking of testing ourselves as being a strategy for learning, everything becomes so much easier. That's why when learning to play the guitar, there's only so many tutorials you can watch before you actually start having to put it into practice. When you're studying for exams, there's no point reading the textbook and just summarizing what's in the textbook. The point is you have to test yourself so that your brain has a chance to work, to retrieve the information, and that is what really drives learning. Spaced repetition. Basically, there's a concept called the forgetting curve that was discovered by a chap called Ebbinghaus in like the 1800s. And the forgetting curve is that whenever we learn anything, whether it's like a fact or a skill or whatever, we're just going to forget it and our memory for the thing is going to decay over time. And so we have to keep on practicing or testing ourselves on the thing to actually continue to have our brain kind of use up space for that kind of thing. Because it's like with our muscles, when we don't use our muscles, our muscles are going to atrophy and they're going to get smaller and we're going to get less hench. Equally with our brain, if we learn, let's say, a language when we were five years old, and then we don't use it for the next 10 years, we're actually going to forget most of the language because our brain doesn't need to have that information in it anymore. Teach what you are trying to learn. We, all, we often have this thing of like, oh, I'm not allowed to teach something until I become an expert at it. But there's this concept that C.S. Lewis talks about that I talk about a lot called the curse of knowledge, which is that when we're, when we're trying to learn something, often we don't learn best from experts. We learn best from people who are just one step in front of us along that same journey. And so the way I think of it is that I would rather learn from a guide than learn from a guru guide versus guru and I would rather be a guide than try and be a guru and certainly for me I found that when I was going through medical school my favorite revision sessions or lectures would be the ones that were given by medical students in the year above me rather than those given by world-class Nobel Prize winning professors because those guys were like old and like really far removed from the things that I needed at the time whereas another medical student just one year above me was like really really helpful but now I have a general policy that whenever I'm learning anything, I'm documenting my process while learning it. And that helps me learn better because I know that I'm possibly going to be teaching this thing a few months or years.